Lake Lanier has seen death and violence long before its waters even filled the valley. Today, during hot summer days, locals flock to the cool man-made lake by the millions. Not many realize the dangers that lurk within the waters of Lake Lanier, or what deadly traps hide beneath its surface. Many claim to see the apparition of a woman in a blue dress in and around Lake Lanier, and she quickly got the nickname, the Lady of the Lake. She's often seen near the bridge at night. Sometimes she's pacing back and forth on top of the bridge, always waiting for someone to approach her. The sheer number of victims at this lake has made many people believe there's a more sinister force at play. But for a nation built on endless cruelty and bloodshed, the true horrors are usually found within our history. This lake seems to take people in one gulp. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. Joining the studio is my boys, Austin. What's up, man? Yo, how's it going? Chilling, man. Chilling. Still still trying to get over this, this sickness, so I apologize if I sound a little nasally, but I've just been getting crushed by the by this illness. I don't even know what it is either. Yeah. Like some virus or I'm, something. I'm a little nasally today, too, by the way. Oh, it sucks so bad. And then we got Daniel behind the screens over there. What's up, man? Hey, everybody. But we are back with another haunting for you today. And this one is dark, man. It's honestly crazy just how dark this story is. Yeah. Behind one of the most haunted lakes, I'd say in the entire world, if not you, or definitely in the United States, I should say. And that is Lake Lanier in Georgia. 12 million people visit this lake every year. Or that's at least what, what they advertise. So obviously people are like, People are going to have accidents. People are going to die. There's going to be drownings, which is true. I mean, there's that happens at every body every of water, lake. pretty much. Yeah. But it seems like it happens. Well, just weird things happen at this lake, for one. But it seems like the deaths happen a little bit more often than and than other places. And you could, you know, people just say, "Oh, it's because that's tons of people go there." But I think there is something else going on here and and you'll hear from the story of how this lake even came to be i think you'll agree with me there's something just much more sinister and dark at hand here because it just it's it's on when you hear the history you're gonna be like what and people go there still yeah and swim here and float around up until like recently its history was kind of shoved under the rug well, not a lot of people knew what had happened there before because it's a man-made lake. It's not even right, a natural right. lake. So yeah. it has a lot of dark history behind it. So much so that there's actually a horror movie in the works called Lanier. And I don't think it's by a big studio or anything like that, but it's it's going to come out this September. It's going to be like a, one of those movies on demand type of thing. Yeah. But, I mean, if that tells you anything, I, mean, I think it's going to be loosely based on it. I don't think it's going to be like a accurate depiction of what yeah. really happened, but there's just so much that's happened there they're like and people know about it but they're like all right we're gonna make a movie based off this place they stayed true to the history they touch on the history they don't shy away from it because i think it's a really important aspect of this haunting absolutely so we are going to get into the haunting of lake lanier but before we do i want to remind you that we still have our cryptid collection available at mileheartmerch.com go get it while it lasts we're quickly running out so if you haven't checked it out yet mileheartmerch.com it's only going to be around for as long as it's available as soon as we're sold out we're moving on to the next collection so it's very very limited but yeah if you can support us in that way we'd really appreciate it if not easy way to support us that's absolutely free just make sure you're subscribed on youtube spotify apple Podcasts, all the places we really appreciate it but with that being said let's just go ahead and dive right into the dark history of lake lanier I don't know about you, but it feels like everything in this world is moving to a subscription-based model. I mean, it's just endless the amount of subscriptions you can rack up. So what's great is that Rocket Money is one of my favorite apps on my phone. It is a personal finance app that not only finds those subscriptions for you and allows you to see what you're actually paying for, but it will help you cancel your unwanted subscriptions. Plus, it monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills. 
Also, it has helped me lower my utility bills, which has been really nice. It helped me get a better deal with my internet service provider even. And it just saves you all the pain and hassle of having to cancel those unwanted subscriptions. You can just hit cancel on the app. It'll go take care of it for you. Plus, with the way the economy is, we're all trying to figure out ways to save money and budget better. Rocket Money helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorizes your expenses so you can easily track your budget in real time. It really gives you the ultimate insight into your finances from a very easy to use app. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. I've probably saved $1,000 to $2,000 last year while using the app. So stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash lights out. That's rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Rocketmoney.com slash lights out. When we think of American hauntings, we usually think of psychopaths, haunted houses, or demonic possessions. But for a nation built on endless cruelty and bloodshed, the true horrors are usually found within our history. The tragedies of the Cherokee people in Oscarville, Georgia, are just some of the many tales of violence and racism in this region of Georgia. And Lake Lanier has seen death and violence long before its waters even filled the valley. Today, during hot summer days, locals flock to the cool man-made lake by the millions. Not many realize the dangers that lurk within the waters of Lake Lanier, or what deadly traps hide beneath its surface. Some believe these hazards are the result of poor planning, but others believe they're the manifestation of a curse, as hundreds of people have died here since the 1950s, and locals and first responders are still pulling bodies from its waters. Others have disappeared forever. But the true horror stories of Forsyth County began centuries before Lake Lanier even existed. Centuries before this region became Forsyth County, Georgia, it was the home of of the Cherokee people. Just a brief history on the Cherokee people. The Cherokee are North American Indians of Iroquoian lineage. Their name comes from the Creek word, meaning people of different speech. During the time of European colonization, this was one of the largest politically integrated tribes in North America, and there were somewhere around 22,500 individuals in the year 1650. They controlled about 40,000 square miles of the Appalachians, including many parts of present-day Tennessee, the Carolinas, and Georgia, which is the place we're covering today. They're known for weaving baskets, making pottery, cultivating maize, beans, and squash. Over the decades of war, genocide, and often broken peace treaties, these things have led to the loss of their people, land, and culture. And by the 1800s, uh, many of them were assimilated into American settler culture. In the 1830s, the Cherokees in Forsyth County were forcibly removed from their land. They had no legal rights in the eyes of U.S. law, and their holdings were taken away from them and sold in a land lottery. The new white landowners were then given legal documents to drive the Cherokees off the land. Many of the Cherokee people were driven off at gunpoint, and some fled to surrounding woods and starved. Eventually, a small faction of Cherokees ceded the rest of the territory to the U.S. government. In return, the remaining Cherokee people were rounded up, packed into wagons, and forced out of Georgia. Many were forced into a reservation in Oklahoma. By the late 1800s, this location had become one of the 200 black towns established across the U.S. after slavery was abolished. Hundreds of black families lived here, and 300 black children attended the local schools, and it quickly became one of the most prosperous black towns in the United States. They named the town Oscarville in the northern part of Georgia where the Cherokees used to live decades before. And today it has a predominantly white population, which wasn't always the case. Patrick Phillips, the author of Blood at the Root, a racial cleansing in America, moved to the area from Atlanta when he was a kid in the 1970s. And the first thing he noticed was how many white people there were compared to Atlanta, just a few dozen miles south. In 1977, racist jokes were shared on the school bus, and black people were often referred to by racial slurs. When Patrick asked why there was such a racial divide in this area, the other kids talked about its history like a mythical folk legend. But the stories were very much real. It began in the late summer of 1912. The local newspapers reported that on September 5th, 1912, a 22-year-old woman 
named Ellen Griech woke up in the middle of the night to find two black men inside her bedroom. Supposedly, they were scared off by Ellen's mother. Local authorities went out to Big Creek, where the break-in had supposedly happened. Ellen then accused two black men, Tony Howell and Isaiah Perkle, of attempting to rape her. Both were just immediately jailed, and they awaited their trial. Meanwhile, a black man named Grant Smith spoke out against the accusations. Grant was a prominent black minister in the area, and supposedly he mentioned to the authorities that at least one of the accused men had been in consenting relationship with Ellen. That didn't sit well with the local white community, so the locals soon found Grant and dragged him into the town square, where they whipped him with horse whips until he nearly died from his injuries. Sheriff Bill Reed intervened just in time to save his life and get him to safety in the courthouse. After the near-fatal beating of the minister, it's not clear what happened in the case of Ellen Griech. Three more black men were accused of being accomplices, but no one was arrested for the assault and near lynching of Grant Smith. He was kept in the courthouse and eventually transferred out of the city for his own safety. So, I mean, who's to say if Ellen was lying or not in this case? We're not really sure. The case, it wasn't even clear what happened in the end, but... It was, at the time, it was a pretty common stereotype in the South that black men sexually assaulted white women. Terrible stereotype. So the white townsfolk would often lynch them to protect what they called white womanhood, whatever that means. But in reality, a lot of these women were just having affairs or they were just in relationships with black men. And a lot of them just didn't want to deal with social backlash of infidelity or an interracial relationship. So they would just blatantly lie. Like in the case of Ellen, maybe her mother just came into the bedroom, found them with right, a black man. Right. She was like, what is he doing in here? So they lie. And it might have been completely consensual. Exactly like Grant Smith was trying to say, but nobody likes that idea at the time. Right. And so it riled up all the white folk. And many of these accusations just cost these black men their lives, unfortunately. Just a week after the case of Ellen Griech, in September 1912, a young white woman was found in the nearby woods within an inch of her life. Passerbys found her beaten, bloodied, and unconscious. She was a young white woman, 18-year-old Sleety Mae Crow, and on September 9th, she had been walking from her home to her aunt's house nearby on Brownsbridge Road. It was near the Forsyth Hall County line. Supposedly, her attacker had pulled up a small dogwood tree by its roots, snuck up behind her and struck her over the head. She was then dragged deeper into the woods, raped and struck at least three more times over the head with a large stone crushing her skull. She then fell into a coma for two weeks and eventually died. The rape and the murder led to the arrest of four black people. Authorities arrested Rob Edwards, his wife Jane Daniel, and her 18-year-old brother Oscar Daniel, as well as a 16-year-old boy named Ernest Knox. Rob Edwards, also known as Big Rob, was supposedly seen near the scene of the crime around the time it occurred. And that's all the evidence that they had on him. He was just nearby. And while he sat in his cell, he was seized by an angry mob. The deputy, Gay Lummis, found out that the local sheriff had organized the abduction of Big Rob from prison. The deputy then tried his best to stop them, but it was no use. The mob had grown into dozens, hundreds, and eventually thousands of angry white people. Supposedly, 2,000 people stormed the jailhouse. They took Big Rob to the town square and beat him with crowbars and then shot him to death. They then wrapped a rope around his neck and dragged him around the town square before stringing his body up on the arm of a telephone pole. And several white spectators then shot bullets into his lifeless body. Hundreds of the townspeople joined in, and there is no record of any indictments or prosecutions for the lynching crimes. As for the 16-year-old Ernest and 18-year-old Oscar, Their trials for the rape and murder of Sleety Mae Crow lasted only one hour. The only piece of evidence in Ernest's case was a small pocket mirror of his that was supposedly found near the crime scene. A few days before, they put him through a mock lynching where they pretended to hang him. This scared Ernest so much that he confessed on the spot to try and avoid the gallows. Both trials happened on the same day with juries of 12 white farmers, and both were found guilty and sentenced to death. They were hanged just outside the city. The hanging area was later described as a county fair. There was a huge celebration and between 5,000 and 8,000 people came out to celebrate and watch the executions. So keep in mind that public executions weren't even legal in Forsyth County at the time. 
But the judge, Newt Morris, ordered a 15-foot high fence to be built around the gallows, so it technically wasn't a public execution. What? Of course, yeah, isn't that insane? Because a fence was built A up? fence, that's all they did. But the night before the hanging, a group of white men burned down the fence, and of course they left the gallows intact. So the city was just like... Because they wanted it publicly public. viewable. Exactly. So the city was just like, hey, we did what we could to make it not public, when they really didn't. It was just a technicality and a loophole. People even took souvenirs from the gallows after the fact, which is disturbing, right? They took pieces of the noose, and one piece is even still preserved in court records, and it's actually placed next to Ernest Knox and Oscar Daniels' names. Oh, wow. So now it acts as kind of an artifact of our disturbing history, right. but at then it was like someone just Prized. wanted this. Yeah. Possession. Exactly. Wow. Plus, the judge, Newt Morris, would later lead a lynch mob in Atlanta just a few years after this. The mob murdered a man named Leo Frank. So you can kind of get the picture of the systemic racism that's built into this system that they had there. And, you know, it's going all the way to the top with the judge. After the attack on Sleety May Crow, the local papers began spreading rumors of a potential black insurrection. The papers claimed there had been a spree of sexual assaults committed by black men and they wanted to rile up the white townspeople. Rumors also spread that the black community conspired to dynamite white people's homes. So on the night after Sleety's funeral, a group of angry white men gathered in town. They would soon get the nickname the Night Riders. They gathered on horses and planned on punishing the entire black community in Oscarville. Technically, the KKK had been defunct since the 1870s, about four decades earlier, but its angry racist roots were still strong in the American South. These night riders lit their torches and burned down the black churches and homes across Oscarville. Attacking churches was a way to break the social and spiritual community. They also shot bullets into their cabin windows, but many of the black people didn't even own the properties they lived in. Many were sharecroppers' cabins, and they stayed here while they were indebted to the white farm owners. Around the same time as these attacks just across the Chattahoochee River in Hall County, similar acts of white terrorism were also growing. But the major difference between the Hall County and the Forsyth County night ride was that the Hall County men were arrested. Their names were listed in the local papers the next day, and they were tried for their crimes. Meanwhile, in Forsyth, none of the night riders were prosecuted, and local law enforcement didn't give a shit and Sleeney May Crow's family was in full support of the violence. They were even quoted calling the local black people the fiends of hell. The riders then drove more families out of their homes, shot their dogs and livestock, and burned their furniture and belongings. So in 1912, almost every black resident of the town was forcibly relocated. Over several months, the night riders exiled 98% of the black people in town, which was roughly 1,100 people. This was about 10% of the entire town at the time. The few black families that stayed behind were the ones who worked for wealthy property owners in the nearby town of Cumming. During the attacks, a white woman named Ruth Jordan joined her father to go check on their black neighbors, the Cook family. They found the house empty and their furniture was shot to pieces. When they called out to the Cook family, they emerged quietly from the nearby woods. They had spent the night there hiding in terror. This is what many families had to do while all of their possessions were destroyed. And they soon fled the area with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Here's actually a clip of a relative of Oscarville residents passing on the story of this terrible time. Night riders came through. They had to leave everything. The main thing they left was property. My grandfather had a hundred acres. So when they got to the Chattahoochee River, from what I understand, they were told when the mob got up on the bridge, they were told that they either had to swim or drown. Most of them didn't make it. My grandfather, one of them that did make it, he lost some brothers and sisters. From what my mother told me, buried all of them. He would sit and tell her this story, and uh, he would just sit and cry. A hundred acres. His grandfather yeah, owned a hundred acres. They just and, had to abandon it. In one of the most prosperous black towns in the U.S. And yet they're just driven out. Yeah. So disturbing. And by the end of October 1912, all the Night Riders had to do was leave a bundle of sticks at a black family's front door. 
and that family would be gone by morning. The homes that weren't burned were left abandoned and later seized by the government for the owners not paying taxes, or their titles were illegally stolen by white landowners over the years. And for the next several decades, Forsyth County remained all white. After the racial cleansing of 1912, many of the white property owners went on to prosper in the region. They became so successful that Oscarville was one of the few farming communities that survived the Great Depression and the bull weevil attacks on cotton. But as the years passed, the state government began looking at the town as a possible water supply location for the Atlanta metro area. Almost everyone in town except for five families were asked to sell their land to the government. Roughly 700 families from three different counties sold a total of 56,000 acres to the U.S. government. And in 1947, the Chamber of Commerce and the Industrial Bureau struck a deal to construct the Buford Dam, which took four years to complete. Once they finished it, they filled in the lake for the first time in 1959. Locals jammed the nearby roads and bridges to watch the water swallow up the land. Its water would eventually supply 6 million people with fresh water. It would soon become known as Georgia's Inland Ocean. And they named the lake after the Georgia poet, Sidney Lanier, who was also dubbed the Poet of the Confederacy. What was once Oscarville was fully submerged beneath the surface and mostly forgotten. This town only lived on through old maps, archived newspaper articles, and oral history. The Forsyth County newspaper had been established in 1908, but for some reason, all of its records before 1917 are completely missing. Probably not by accident. And much of Oscarville's history wasn't even remembered until the 1980s. A civil rights march in 1987 became one of the first public moments that the tragedy in Forsyth County was addressed in modern times. Before the introduction of the lake, many of the remains of Oscarville had been removed by the Army Corps of Engineers before the valley was filled. But the traces of buildings and fence posts and other lost relics remained. Debris from the roads and bridges still cover the lake floor. Most of the trees from the surrounding forest were cut down to the stumps. But some of the submerged trees still stand 70 feet from the bottom. All these hazards have become a problem for swimmers and boaters, especially during seasons of drought. Still, many use Lake Lanier as a vacation spot to relax and unwind, especially during the summer months. 11 to 14 million people a year visit the lake and take their chances. It now currently has 625 billion gallons of water, almost a million Olympic-sized swimming pools, and it stretches 38,000 acres with plenty of places to boat and camp along the shores. Its deepest point is 200 feet right near the Buford Dam. As the years passed, many noticed a shocking number of victims drowned in the lake. Somewhere between 600 and 700 people have died since the lake was first created in the 1950s. Not all drownings, but still. 700 people have lost their lives while visiting this lake. And some of the victims have just simply disappeared, never to be seen again. Boats have blown up at docking stations and others have collided head-on with each other. The sheer number of victims at this lake has made many people believe there's a more sinister force at play, and these deaths might not all be accidents. Every year, head-on boating accidents plague the waters, and overconfident swimmers often get caught in the deep water. From the surface, these waters look clear and gentle, but time and time again, people disappear. And many eyewitnesses have noticed that victims aren't often seen struggling at the surface before drowning. They're just gone, without a trace. Buck Buchanan, a search and rescue diver who has worked at the lake in recent years, said, This lake seems to take people in one gulp. For years, he's had to reach into the pitch black waters to grab hold of lifeless arms and legs to bring bodies to the surface. This lake is 26 miles long and has 700 miles of shoreline. You could argue that the massive size of the lake might cause an overwhelming amount of deaths. Even though Lake Lanier is the largest lake in Georgia, there are plenty of lakes that are roughly the same size throughout the United States that don't even have half the amount of casualties. And Lake Alatoona, only 40 miles away, has about the same amount of visitors each year, but only one third of the deaths. Many have come to believe the only explanation is that these waters are haunted by negative paranormal energies. Those who visit claim they can sense something odd about the lake, even when just standing on its shores. Its blue waters seem majestic from a distance, but if you ever take the plunge, 
you could be risking your life. Even if you submerge yourself into the waters when you're by yourself, you get the feeling that you're not alone. And some have explained that the water feels thicker than it should. In one rescue mission, a woman had fallen off the side of a boat. And when the rescue crew saved her, they explained it happens all the time in Lake Lanier. But the woman was embarrassed. She was a young lifeguard and a great swimmer. But she told them the water felt like swimming in molasses. For decades, researchers have examined the lake to try and explain the unusual amount of casualties. Some believe it has something to do with where the lake was created. Many believe the victims of Lake Lanier get caught in the debris from the ghost towns on the bottom. The old brick chimneys and 70-foot trees can catch people off guard, and in drought seasons, it's even worse. Plus, the lake was created in a valley, so the lake bottom never formed naturally like other lakes. The water isn't shallow toward the shore, gradually getting deeper towards the center like natural lakes. In some areas, it can be knee-deep in one area and then a sheer 20-foot plunge. But these hazards might only be one part of the problem. Others believe a dark force might be pulling victims down deeper into the water. In the past few decades, researchers have recently confirmed the suspicions of a focal point for possible paranormal energy. It was known that about 20 local cemeteries had to be relocated because the lake was created, and dozens, possibly even hundreds of graves had to be dug up and moved. Many of the Civil War veterans' burials had been on private property in their family plots. Even though the Corps of Engineers claimed they moved all the burials, some families filed complaints saying they were never notified or the bodies were never actually moved. But the complaints were pretty much ignored, and the construction of the dam in Lake Lanier continued. In 2007, researchers confirmed that not all the sites had been dealt with. That year, there was a severe drought in the area and the water levels dropped. The debris of an old racetrack, the Gainesville Speedway, breached the surface. And this was also when researchers discovered the area they called the Summer Ore Mounds. While the Corps of Engineers removed the foundations of old properties and trees decades ago, they ignored a significant mound along the west bank of the upper Chattahoochee River. Before the drought, this area of the valley had been fully submerged, but now it was obvious a Cherokee and Creek burial ground once existed here at this mound. The pottery and the other artifacts date back to somewhere between 800 and 985 CE. The mound once sat along an old east-west trail not far from the remains of a Cherokee village. And what's worse is that the mound had actually been discovered back in 1951 during the survey of the area before the construction of the dam. And instead of protecting the area, the burial mound was desecrated and submerged. Some reported that all the bodies had been removed from the burial mound, but many believe this was a lie in order to just move the project forward. Some blame the failure on poor subsurface scanning tech back from the 1950s, but it was clear that the water supply for Atlanta Metro is more important than this ancient burial ground. So the waters of Lake Lanier crept in. Many believe that countless bodies of Cherokee and Creek indigenous Americans still remain beneath the surface. Once the sacred ground was violated, many believe the dark energy began seeping into the lake's waters and the power of ancestral spirits might have cursed the lake forever. In Native American tradition, there's a widespread belief in curses, especially when it comes to land-based curses. And it kind of stems from this strong belief in animism, which is kind of a multi-faced religion that has been all over the world, but it's basically, to sum it up, is a belief that the material world is infused with spiritual essence. So animism perceives all things, animals, plants, rivers, rocks, people, as alive. This religion can be found all over the world, and some say it's one of the earliest forms of religion found on the planet. Um, here's a brief clip of Chief Misel Joe, a spiritual and political leader for the First Nation people, talking about what animism means to him. I walk in the woods, and that's my church. I talk to people, and that's my church. So I'm not bound by having to go to this one little building to uh, you know, pray and to speak to my creator. I, I do that here. I, I do it, particularly in the woods, I do it. So I have no, no incredible hang-ups about not going to church. So as this belief ties to their burial mounds, as far as I could understand it, uh, many Cherokee traditions have long-standing beliefs on how to treat their dead. 
it's very important to them and especially to not even disturb these burial sites or the bodies buried there so i i found it ridiculous that the people were like hey there's this burial mound there and they were like oh no but we moved all the bodies it's okay yeah like you're like still that's... desecrating the mound that so either way if you moved them or not you've destroyed this place that's sacred so yeah i i tend to to really believe i i mean i, f I find animism to be very interesting and and honestly I, I tend to believe in it honestly like you know somebody who grew up in a traditional sense of church like i've found that just being in nature is my church now yeah and definitely. i feel most spiritual when i'm surrounded by nature and Same. trees and and you know really feeling grounded to the earth I, I find that very interesting and you know it's just they're so wise i mean they're just so well connected with their spirituality and just shows like especially like our government you know how disconnected they are not not just from spirituality but just you know the the beginnings of of, of human civilization i mean these people have been here for thousands and thousands of years and to just completely disrespect them by being like oh this is inconvenient for our project so we're just going to dig you up and and move you without actually like thinking deeper about what's actually you know how sacred this ground is and I mean, and just digging up dead bodies in general. I mean, even for Oscarville and just being like, oh, we're just going to relocate them because we need this area. Yep. I mean, it's just, I, I do believe that this area is cursed because, and as we've seen in, in other episodes where people have built upon burial grounds, there is intense paranormal energy. There is things that, that happen that are completely unexplainable. And you, and when you, the only explanation you can seem to get is from the history of it. And you start realizing like, oh, this was a sacred burial ground and you disturbed it by building X, Y, and Z on here. Of course, of course you're going to have these problems. Yeah. Of course you're going to have all these, these deaths and, and accidents that happen and at a much higher rate than somewhere else where you didn't necessarily disturb. Cause, cause I mean, obviously the controversy is, is it just the sheer amount of people that are here that that's why the, there's a higher rate of casualties here. But I think when you really dive into the history and you especially learn about just how dark it was and just how little of a fuck the the government gave when they when it came to building Lake Lanier. Yeah. That they're just like, you know, oh well, you know, small price to pay, I guess. Yeah, and I guarantee you they didn't consult any of the no Cherokee or never, Creek people, no. right? And it was I mean, if you follow the money too, it was like we're gonna do this Buford Dam and then we're gonna do Lake Lanier because they could just see the economic well yeah they're trying i mean they're clear they did that for atlanta to build atlanta out and make it bigger and bigger right and you know ultimately money is at the root of all of this but yeah, yeah i mean it, it makes complete sense to me and i'm sure many of you out there are like yeah no shit there's so many unexplainable deaths here and, right. and just horrific things that happen is because you you disturb disturb something very sacred and very ancient that was here long before any of us that we should have respected that we didn't yep. and now we're we're paying the consequences of that it makes complete sense to me same with rising interest rates and the cost of living seemingly at an all-time high now is the time to finally take initiative with your debt stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from pds debt pds debt is giving our qualified listeners a free debt savings analysis just for completing the 30 second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash out you'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt if you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down this program is for you i've been in this boat before it sucks it sucks to feel like you're just throwing away money and your debt isn't getting any smaller well pds debt rolls all of your payments into one low zero percent interest monthly payment I've used a similar style program to this before to get out of probably like five to $10,000 worth of credit card debt in less than a year when it would have taken me probably three or four years to do it traditionally. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies and there is no minimum credit score required, which is key. Bad and fair credit is accepted. Save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. PDSDebt is offering free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash out. That's pdsdebt.com slash out. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash 
out. Despite countless tragedies and warnings at Lake Lanier, people still swim in its waters daily. The death rate has only increased in recent decades. About 200 have died since 1994, and it's also reported that 27 bodies have never been recovered. People have simply just gone missing in the water, never to be seen again. Even after rescue teams have dredged the bottom and sent experienced dive teams, some of the victims have mysteriously vanished with no explanation whatsoever. Rescue teams have known exactly where some of these victims entered the lake and exactly what water currents were at play, but some of the bodies still have not been found. Some have tried to give rational explanations for where these bodies have mysteriously disappeared to, like alligators eating the bodies, but there are no natural alligators in Lake Lanier. Some have been dropped off there, but they're usually identified quickly and removed by wildlife services. Without any rational explanations, many have turned to the paranormal for answers. And one story has explained why so many people are dragged to the bottom of the lake and disappear. The story of the lady in the lake has made it to the front page, Georgian folklore, and she dates back to April 1958. Two young women named Delia May Parker Young and Susie Roberts were at a local dance at the Three Gables, a roadhouse in Dawsonville, Georgia, and they decided to leave early. Susie drove them both in her 1954 Ford sedan, and on their way home, they crossed a bridge over Lake Lanier. Susie somehow lost control of the car, and it swerved and broke the side rail before spiraling off the edge, crashing into the dark waters below. Authorities noticed a set of skid marks on the bridge. It was obvious a car had gone off the side, and it was assumed that the women both died in the lake. In the years since, others have reported their steering wheel veering towards the lake by an invisible force. But when they sent divers down to investigate, there was no trace of a car or the women. About a year after the accident, a local fisherman was walking along the shore near where the accident had happened. As he looked out toward one of the bridges, he saw a horribly decomposed body slowly floating along the water. The body was so decomposed, no one could identify who the victim was, and the cause of death was undetermined. The strange thing about the body was that both hands were missing. Many assumed that this had to have been the body of Susie or Delia but at the time, it was impossible to know. Jane Doe was later buried in the 1970s, but decades later in 1990, a team of engineers dredged the lake bed to set the foundation of a new bridge. They knew the waters of Lake Lanier had the remains of a ghost town beneath its surface, but they were surprised when their machinery hit a strange metal object about 90 feet below. Lo and behold, it was the shell of an old 1954 Ford sedan. The car rested on a steep slope gouged by a giant tree trunk, as the years passed, mud and debris covered most of the car. And when they hauled it out of the water, they discovered the skeletal remains of Susie Roberts inside. They identified her through dental records. This meant that the body discovered back in 1959 was most likely Susie's friend, Delia. Both women could now finally rest in peace, but in the years since 1958, many claimed to see the apparition of a woman in a blue dress in and around Lake Lanier and she quickly got the nickname, the Lady of the Lake. She's often seen near the bridge at night. Sometimes she's pacing back and forth on top of the bridge, always waiting for someone to approach her. And she has no hands. But once a curious victim gets close enough, she drags them down to the bottom of the lake and drowns them. One visitor named Rachel Sanders went swimming in the lake in November 2019. That day she was training for a triathlon. She had swam in the lake her entire life, but this time she experienced something she couldn't explain. The skies were clear and the waters were calm, but as she swam, she heard a high-pitched shriek from somewhere deep in the water. She then felt a force beneath her pulling downward like a hand clutching her ankles. Her head plunged beneath the surface and in a few moments, everything went black. She woke up on the shore of a small island in the middle of the lake. And when she got up and looked out into the water, she saw the figure of a woman wearing a blue dress beneath the surface. Rachel refused to get back in the water, so she climbed to the island's highest point and flagged down a boat that took her back to shore. <clears throat> so what's the rational explanation behind this one? Yeah, yeah. Your, your, uh, your neighborhood secondary skeptic here besides Danny, Austin here. <laughs> yeah, what happened some, here? Some skeptics, they do claim that Rachel was just suffering from hypothermia. She was swimming in the lake in November, and those water temperatures get down to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So not obviously not freezing That's temps because it's pretty a, cold. Though. That is really cold. I mean, I can barely stand like yeah, like sixty degrees. Fifty five is pretty cold. Right. Like most people don't want to swim without a wetsuit with that. Right. So forty five. Yeah. It wasn't confirmed that it was forty five that day, but temperatures get down roughly in the lake on average in November. Yeah. And cold water can lower the body's temperature 25 times faster than air. So if you're getting into 45 degree Fahrenheit, your body is dropping very quickly. So what the body does is it tries to keep the blood flow closer to the heart, which then obviously pulls it away from your limbs, your extremities, and your your brain, which leads to loss of coordination, confusion, and possibly hallucinations. But others argue that Rachel had swam in the lake many times before she's obviously trained in this she was training for a triathlon yeah it wasn't like her first time first swim out there right she's healthy she's young she's a good swimmer so she was a trained athlete plus people argue that rachel wasn't the only one who's encountered this lady of the lake so it's like was it a coincidence that she's having a hallucination that all lines up with this apparition seems very unlikely to me i mean it's like clearly i mean it's like at what point was she tripping or hallucinating from the hypothermia yeah right like and and what are the why would it be right after right she has this weird feeling of being dragged down you know by something right or like it's just it it seems like a very convenient explanation for this versus and and what are the chances that you know you're hallucinating from hypothermia and the one thing you hallucinate is it's the lady the in the lake yeah. and it's described to a T like the same way that everybody else sees her. Yep. It's all very it'd be all big coincidence Quite a, if that yeah, were exactly that were the case. It seems yeah. this seems pretty believable to me. Yeah. Others have seen her apparition near Alta Vista Cemetery in Gainesville, just east of the lake. This is where many of the graves were relocated before the water filled the valley, including where Adelia May Parker Young was buried. One local resident was crossing through the cemetery late one night when he thought he heard the howling of an animal, but he soon realized it was someone shrieking. As he looked in the distance toward the tree line, he saw the figure of a shadowy woman wearing a blue dress, and in the blink of an eye, she was gone. Other visitors have reported seeing other apparitions in and around Lake Lanier. A common one has been a shadowy figure sitting on a small raft at night. The figure looks like a man slowly moving across the water. He uses a pole to push himself along the lake's jagged floor. Resting against his shoulder is a long stick with a lantern at the top. The lantern swings back and forth, casting a soft light across the murky water beneath him. Those who have seen this figure claim the apparition appears and disappears out of nowhere. One sighting was reported by two fishermen around 1 a.m. on a cold autumn night. From the shore, they spotted the raft in the section of the lake about 45 feet deep, but the figure in the raft had no problem pushing himself along. The fishermen watched silently as the figure glided across the water in the moonlight. Suddenly, the figure noticed the fishermen and began shouting something they couldn't understand before diving off the raft into the water. As moments passed, the figure's head never emerged, and the men realized the figure might be swimming beneath the surface coming straight toward them. They quickly reeled in their lines and packed their gear. They shined their flashlights to get one last glance out at the water, but the raft had disappeared, and there was no trace of the figure anywhere. The water sat undisturbed like nothing was there in the first place. Many believe this figure is the ghost of an old traveler. He might be an echo of the past, a man who had lost his life in the foothills of northern Georgia before Lake Lanier even existed. Along with the ghost stories, many modern-day visitors to Lake Lanier still report strange activity in and near the water, but it rarely turns the visitors away. And over Memorial Day weekend just last year, seven people drowned. One man even drowned in one of the designated swimming areas, and rescue teams had to use a side-scan sonar system to locate his body beneath the water. His remains had to be removed from the lake by rescue divers in a helicopter, These divers who risk their lives to find these bodies have to deal with large chunks of debris and pitch black waters towards the bottom. By evening, some have even described the waters as literally pitch black, and the deeper you go, the darker it gets. One diver, Richard Pickering, has made it his mission to find lost items down in the depths. He straps on his 40-pound oxygen tanks and dives into the frigid waters that get near freezing temperatures. Beneath the surface, he has found endless treasures. Dozens of rings, car keys, and even full pickup trucks in the murky waters. 
and who knows how many of these things once belonged to the dead. He also finds serious hazards that he helps clear out of the water because he knows too many swimmers lose their lives in the lake. But one of the worst tragedies at the lake didn't even begin in hazardous waters, and the victim's destination wasn't even Lake Lanier. On Christmas Day 1964, the Brown and Rogers families lived in the same home in Gainesville, not far from the lake. There were four adults and seven children. The children were between one and six years old. After opening presents, the mothers began work on the Christmas meal. And around 1 p.m., they all decided they wanted some apples from a local orchard. So the two families piled into one of the cars, all 11 of them. The orchard was just across the lake. So they made their way toward the two-mile bridge on Highway 141. But this is where the driver, Mr. Brown, lost control of the car. As they came down a slope around a curve, the car slid toward the edge of the road and clipped the guardrail. As it bounced off the guardrail, it hit a power pole so hard it snapped in half. And the car flipped head over heel into the freezing waters of Lake Lanier. The onlookers, 16-year-old Martha McConnell and her stepdad, watched the entire freak accident, and they quickly ran to help. Rescue divers and local fire departments also responded to the scene, but they reported near-zero visibility that day, and the black waters were nearly impossible to navigate. The car had sunk to the bottom within minutes, nearly 30 feet below the surface. First responders saw Martha's stepdad helping the survivors in the shallow water, he then looked down and saw what he thought was a doll belonging to one of the children floating out where the car had hit the water. The floating doll later turned out to be one of the deceased children. In the end, seven of the family members died, two adults including the driver, and five children. Reports at the time claimed that Mr. Brown had been driving the car after drinking rot gut liquor that Christmas morning. And that was how Christmas Day 1964 became the deadliest day at Lake Lanier. And these horror stories have continued every year since. Even stories where victims have survived are just as haunting. In 2022, a mother, her nine-year-old son Noah, and her assistant visited the Margaritaville section of the lake. It's where a resort and water park sit right off of the shore, and many swimmers go into the bay-like area of the lake to swim. The woman took her son into the water for about 45 minutes, and then she told her assistant she was going to grab some water and she'd be right back. She was literally only gone for a moment, And when she returned, she saw her assistant, but her son was gone. He had been wearing a bright red shirt and should have been easy to spot, but he was nowhere to be seen. She dove into the lake and began looking underwater for his bright red shirt. Deeper into the water is when she finally spotted him. He was floating just above the lake floor, and one of his legs appeared to be suspended straight toward the bottom like something had grabbed onto him. She recovered his body before getting him back to the shore. And as lifeguards arrived, they administered CPR and radioed for the park rangers. Minutes passed and the boy was still unresponsive. After about 10 minutes of CPR, they finally got a pulse and they were able to transport him to Metro Atlanta Pediatrics Trauma Center. It's important to note that Noah has sickle cell anemia, which makes this even more scary. Um, Sickle cell is an inherited disorder that affects the shape of red blood cells, and there are several symptoms including anemia, episodes of extreme pain, swelling of hands and feet, delayed growth, and vision problems. But what the doctors were most worried about was the bacteria in the lake water causing an infection because he had inhaled and some of it had gotten in, in his lungs and a lot in his stomach as well. And people with sickle cell are much more prone to severe infections. So even though that they got a pulse, it was still going to be a huge problem for his life. Yeah. yeah, Getting that water out and making sure um, he was all right. So doctors immediately had to do a blood transfusion because he had ingested some of that lake water. When they finished the transfusion and stabilized him, they tried to figure out what caused Noah to almost drown in the first place. Dozens of other visitors were also swimming in the same area of the lake, but didn't have any issues. And the medical staff figured that he had suffered from a seizure while swimming before floating down toward the bottom of the lake. But his mother recalled him looking like something had grabbed onto his ankle and held him toward the bottom. Whether you believe he had a seizure or if something actually pulled him downward, it's stories like Noah's that have convinced people of Lake Lanier's curse. And some wish they would just close the lake to the public entirely. But as of 2000, it's estimated that the lake's economic impact is over $5.5 billion annually And the generators at the dam produce more than $96 million in hydroelectricity. 
It also has 68 parks and recreation areas, 122 campgrounds with more than 1,200 campsites, 10 full-service marinas with restaurants, gas docks, pump-out stations, and boat storage. So despite the deaths and horrors, this man-made lake is going nowhere anytime soon. No fatal curse can stop the flow of money at Lake Lanier. Seems like uh, the message here is swim at your own risk because something's going on here yeah i mean noah's story really i first heard about noah's story on tiktok actually i think his mom posted uh kind of like a retelling of what happened on there and i remember watching it and i was just like oh my god because she was very adamant about the fact that it was very weird yeah how it was almost like he was gone he just like disappeared yeah, yeah. and it's like he was pulled down because it's like when drowning unless you're having a seizure or you pass out, you know, and you just kind of sink at that point. Usually, like people drowning, there's a kind of a fight. You yeah, know what you're I up mean? Towards like the surface, right? Yeah, yeah and it's splashing. Right, people are right. calling out for help before they go underneath. Right, yeah. right. Which there were a bunch of other people. If you see, she has, she has his mom has pictures of him, like right before. Yeah, this is a populated before. area. Which yeah, is, there were other swimmers, and it's it's a very like relaxed resort area too, where people hang out and then they can go in kind of semi shallow. Right. Waters, and then he's just gone it's just like a split second and then all of a sudden he's at the bottom of the lake yeah and the fact that she she specifically remembers his lake his or his leg being like at a weird angle where it's almost like an invisible hands holding him down there right that's scary and that's just one story of many yeah with similar experiences at lake lanier and we can i mean you could obviously say like yeah a lot of the deaths are just you know drunk people boating accidents right. and, and stuff like that but i there are too many suspicious deaths, especially with the bodies disappearing. That's really disturbing. And to not me being that, found at all. Yeah. yeah they're yeah. just simply gone is, is wild. Which to it me. is a, a very, it's a pretty deep lake. It's huge. Yeah. But I mean, the fact that they have dredged it a number of times and still haven't found some of the bodies. Yeah. That people have disappeared is very eerie to me. And even that old one where, you know, the two women careened off the side of the bridge and they were like, well, here are the skid marks. Yeah. Here's the broken rail. They went down there. They couldn't even find the car, which is yeah. mind blowing to me. I just think with, how, especially once you know the history of of this lake, and if you even, I think even if you're uh, skeptical, I think you still you have to give this a little bit of yeah. Because I don't, you know, I, I don't here. really believe in a lot of hunting stuff, but something is clearly wrong with this lake. Whether it be totally natural or or just the fact that it's built on all these weird landscapes something is clearly not right you won't catch me at lake lanier no yeah. i don't really like lakes in general honestly oh really no I'll just yeah like i know some of the great lakes up in yeah like, I'm your, from your, your hometown so, there there's I, some stories up there too yeah lake there's Mead, a lot of has a lot going on yeah there. lake superior i went to the up last summer and you can still see all the shipwrecks because they're those waters get really tumultuous up there that's how a deep huge, do those get how lake deep superior are those great lakes lake superior is huge uh, it's not I, hundreds of feet. Yeah. Danny might have to look that up, but I think Lake Superior is up there with one of the deepest, uh, freshwater lakes. 1300 feet. 1300 feet. Deep oh as hell. God. It's like so a Lake small Lanier ocean. Is nothing compared to. Yeah. Lake Superior yeah, it is. It's a small massive. ocean. And, uh, yeah, you can still see like all the, the bolts coming through the wood that are just washed up on, on the shores of like all these shipwrecks. Oh, People wow. just getting destroyed. So you got to make there. sure you got it had your tetanus shot before walking yeah, along yeah. the great lakes beaches yeah i uh i mostly went to lake huron though a nice little uh bay area on lake huron which was really it's nice. a nice one yeah super nice in the water since it's a little more shallow the waters get really warm there because sometimes the great lakes waters are frigid yeah like you're not going swimming in there no nah. like you go up to mackinac island and it's just freezing cold waters the 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 Straits of Mackinac. They used to hold these swimming competitions, but too many people were dying because it was just freezing too cold. cold. Oh wow! Yeah. I'm surprised Lake Lanier gets cold as cold as it does. Right, you being in Georgia, Georgia, like that's pretty far south. Like, yeah, I know. I know the South still gets cold, but like that cold, like yeah, 45, 45 degree water. That's yeah, pretty right. damn cold. That's yeah. like I don't know, if you were to go see what the average temp of like Colorado Mountain lakes are, it'd be like. 40 degrees or something right or, yeah i don't know it was probably a little bit colder but but i mean in the summer though it gets still pretty warm up, yeah. up high elevations so. i've yet i've yet to go into any lakes yeah, i've here. been in uh uh 
Georgetown Lake in the summer. And it was nice. Yeah, you told me to go out yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, Don't they have a hot fishing. springs out there too? Uh, not near there, but a little bit farther in the mountains. Oh, okay. Idaho Springs has some oh, okay. hot springs up there. Nice. But yeah, Lake Lanier, man, there's definitely something going on. I got to ask the the biggest skeptic in the room what he thinks about this one. Because <laughs> how can you deny this history, man? What do you think? You think this is just all like, you think there's uh, statistics to back let me, this one up? Let me answer for Danny. <laughs> I'm going to guess he thinks it's all bullshit. <laughs> Surprisingly, just, no. No, oh, I don't think it's all bullshit. I think um, he, I pressured him into saying that. <laughs> are you paying him under the table here to make him a believer? Uh, whether or not I believe that there's something paranormal going on, I mean, I still think that's kind of up for debate. Um, definitely something weird going on. Definitely something weird. Uh, even just the the satellite image of the lake, it looks really interesting. It doesn't. It's not a normal lake. It looks almost like a fractal, which kind of yeah. makes sense when you mention that it's twenty something. Uh, miles uh, wide, or tw- there's like 27. The shoreline, yeah, yeah. Like 700 miles of shoreline. It's yeah. crazy. It's yeah. absolutely nuts. Um, because it didn't form naturally. Exactly. They just it's, dumped water into this jelly. Yeah. yeah. It's. I mean, if there was going to be a place full of evil spirits, this would be it. There's nothing more evil on this planet than humans, in my opinion. And the only thing, second, the only thing that's second to the evilness of humans is water. <laughs> Not that water is evil, but I think we've all learned, especially over the past two weeks, that you know water is going to do what it's going to do to you, and there's there's no way about it. Yeah, yeah. Mother Nature and water they're uh, pretty scary. Oh, are you yeah. are you referencing the Titanic ti- so, Titan? Yeah, the Titan yeah, submersible. Yeah. yeah, I know. Well, just in at those depths, it's crazy. I mean, exactly. the sheer amount of force that water has is mind blowing. Yeah, and I'm wondering too with them not being able to find the bodies. Do you think that sometimes those bodies could be lodged under some of the uh, remnants of the town that was still under there? How and that that's why they though? couldn't find them. Currents just like push it under there. Maybe I or? don't know. I bet there are debris traps. I mean, there has to be with yeah. the amount of crap that's in there. Right? Yeah. I mean, it would make sense. And I mean, water's going to decompose bodies far faster, than, exactly. yeah, but not cold true. water. True. True. I mean, if it's, uh, you would think the deeper you go, the colder the water. So exactly. Which is scary to think about like swimming yeah. around in there that like, 40 feet below there's just like bodies potentially like hooked on the stuff and yeah. it's like yeah but it's like they God, the divers disturbing. go down there all the time like it's divers just, are diving yeah. in those areas so you'd think that they would run into bodies more often and and you know especially like older you know deaths from you know 10 20 years ago or something yeah. that maybe there'd be still some remains there but i think even in colder i think over time just oh, yeah. and, and obviously there's creatures yeah you know what i mean all, you know yeah. this isn't a swimming pool this is yeah. a lake so there's going to be fish and, and other I types of we have to creatures take into account turtles them, like yeah turtles yeah turtles, will turtles will flesh, so, you, for yeah. sure and we also have to take into account that they a lot of people describe the depths when you go down it's pitch black so right and that's why when that one diver was talking about he just had to like kind of reach into pitch black to try and oh, find bodies no. right and pitch they, black water i think all of us is like yeah, absolutely <laughs> no no i'm not <laughs> i'm not diving into pitch black water i like the clear crystal clear water where i can see my feet at the bottom when i'm walking around right even yeah. like i was just at, in south carolina and, and or danny and i were in mm-hmm. the whole time where you know we're thinking like what could be swimming around at our ankles because you can't see at all and you know there's i mean we know firsthand there's tons of sharks everywhere oh yeah so you guys like, caught a bunch you know, of uh, so uh, i mean a pitch black lake no thank you no, never thanks. know what you're gonna rub up against you know and is this also not the most american story oh like, yeah it's yeah. like we we God. cover it all we got the genocide we have the racial cleansing we have the desecration of of burial grounds all for economic right. profit this right? is this is the american story yeah, yeah. and now we party on top of it all yeah right. exactly <laughs> yeah. Yeah. now it's a place we go and relax yeah. and and party your ass off yeah, you couldn't you couldn't write any other nope, more American nope, story here no. than, than Lake Lanier. No, nope. and then yeah, they even named it after he was he's a Confederate poet, but yeah, he was a Confederate soldier. Yeah, of course yeah. it is. Good old Georgia man, gotta love it. Ah, uh, so yeah, that is the haunting story of Lake Lanier. I'm sure there's many of you out there who have been there and have your own stories, and we definitely want to hear about it. So let us know in the comments if you're watching on YouTube or on social media. Where it lights out cast pretty much everywhere. But yeah, let us know your thoughts. 
I, I tend to believe this is an absolutely haunted location. I mean, there's just the the history explains it for me. I mean, obviously, if you're not a paranormal believer, which what are you doing? But if you're not, then I think even you can think, okay, something's something's up here. Something there's sure. a weird there's some weird aspect to this, and maybe it's by design, and or maybe it's just all a coincidence. But yeah, there's definitely something dark going on here beneath the surface of Lake Lanier. But that is going to be it for us today. We will catch you guys next time with another spooky one. Until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs>